Hello everyone, this is All Algorithms Equal. And so I concluded the last video with the statement of the law of quadratic reciprocity. But we didn't have much time for analysis. Today we'll look at some examples and implications of this golden law. So first we have an example where p equals 5 and q equals 13, as you can see. And I'd like to remind you that P and Q are defined to be distinct odd primes in order for the law of quadratic reciprocity to hold. And so what we actually have is a listing of each of the quadratic residues modulo 5. And this is just regarding this first part. You know, as I described in the last video, there's a certain pattern to the quadratic residues modulo a prime number, and so we can calculate them, at least for this for this small case where p equals 5. You know, it would be more difficult if p were a larger prime number, like 127. But in this case, of course, we have 1 squared is equal to 4 squared is equal to 16, which is equal or congruent to 1 modulo 5. And secondly, we have 2 squared being equal to 3 squared, and, and they're both congruent to 4 modulo 5. And we can tell, of course, that 13 is not one of these numbers. So it's not one of these quadratic residues modulo 5. Now that's one bit of information. And it's an important piece of information, as we'll see later. So 13 is not a quadratic residue modulo 5. We also know, however, uh, on 13's end, right below it, if we were to write out all of these different quadratic residues, we would know that the, the quadratic residues modulo 13, including, you know, all of these positive integers up to 13, are 1, 3, 4, 9, 10, and 12. And so therefore 5 is not included in that, not included in that list. And so, clearly it is, it is not a quadratic residue modulo 13 either. And what's another way of logically deducing this? The Golden Theorem, of course, the, the law of quadratic reciprocity. And so I'm going to show you what that states and, and how we can deduce that from it. So again, we know that if P and Q are distinct odd primes, so they're, they're different odd primes, then using the Legendre notation, we can say P over Q evaluated meaning, you know, is P a quadratic residue modulo Q multiplied by going the other way, Q over P so, you know, the determination of whether Q is a quadratic residue modulo P is equal to as proven by Gauss, negative 1 to the quantity P minus 1 over 2 times q minus 1 divided by 2. And so this is the law. Don't violate it. <laughs> okay, so substituting p and q from what we just saw, what we just logically deduced uh, about, you know, 5 and 13, let's see what we get here, okay? So we know 5 over 13, that, you know, evaluated, whether it's a quadratic residue, multiplied by 13, whether that's a quadratic residue over 5, is equal to, and let's just substitute from here, so it's the quantity negative 1, and it's to the power, well, let's see, p is 5, uh, 5 minus 1 over 2 times 13 minus 1 over 2, and of course we can simplify that. In that case, that would be, well, actually, I can just put it over here, negative 1, to a certain power, it's negative 1, 2, the, let's see, 4 over 2 is here, so that's squared times 13 minus 1 is 12, divided by 2 we get 6, and so basically we have that this is equal to 1. And let us also recall for a moment that P, P on Q, this Legendre notation, returns 1 only if 
P is a quadratic residue modulo Q. So just give me a moment right now. Okay, and, and what we just demonstrated is that, well, 5 is not a quadratic residue, so, you know, we can say it's a quadratic non-residue, modulo 13, and, of course, 13 is a non-residue, modulo 5. So, again, substituting, we can get negative 1 times negative 1 being equal to what we just obtained on the right side, which is 1, and, of course, this equation checks out. Negative 1 squared equal to 1, and that is, of course, true. It's well done how we can see a demonstration of this. And in fact, without even going through all these calculations, you know, all these different calculations just to check if this is true, we could in fact just have done this top half, whether 13 is a quadratic residue modulo 5, and then, using this equation, using this formula here, we could have determined whether 5 is a quadratic residue modulo 13, and we would have known that the answer is no. In other words, if we knew one of these variables, if we knew p over q, and we knew the values of p and q, then we can, then we can divide out and, and logically deduce this. So in this case, it would have been, you know, negative 1 times x is equal to 1, and of course, multiply both sides by negative 1, and you can get that x, this missing value in theory, uh, would be a negative 1. And so it's very interesting, and another way of getting to that answer. And, you know, again, this is just one example, and we see that it holds true. However, I'm sure you're wondering, what is the general rule for the pattern that emerges here? We have a formula, but can we make better sense of it? Well, indeed we can, and I've demonstrated this bit of a, a table for you, right here. These are sort of my own notes, but um, we can see, you know, the law of quadratic reciprocity. P over Q times Q over P equals negative 1 to this quantity, P minus 1 over 2 times Q minus 1 over 2. And if we actually really consider what the different values of P and Q are, and what patterns they follow, you know, what, what uh, rules they obey, then we can, we can analyze this better. For instance, if we study each of the primes P and Q, we know that they are odd primes. So therefore, P, you know, for an odd prime, if we subtract 1 from it, we get an even number. So we can safely divide by 2, which makes sense. But if you think about it, what makes the main difference is whether this side of the equation evaluates to negative 1 or positive 1. Because, you know, negative 1 to some integer is obviously just going to be either positive or negative 1. And so, if we presume that p minus 1 is divisible by 4, then we know that the exponent of negative 1 is an even number. And thus we know that this whole side of the equation evaluates to 1, so k, what I call k, equals 1 in that case. And what that really means is that both p and q are quadratic residues, or both are non-residues relative to each other. And again, I, I believe I've explained this in an earlier video, but um, if we have this notation, p is congruent to 1 modulo 4, well that means it's 1 greater than a multiple of 4. Or in other words, p minus 1 is divisible by 4. So, by substitution, we can actually say that this right side of the equation is, well, p minus 1, we know this quantity is divisible by 4, so we get 4a over 2 times some other integral quantity, q minus 1 over 2. And then we can simplify this a little bit further, cross out the 2 and the 4, and, and we end up with negative 1 to some integer times another integer, q minus 1 over 2, 
and it's that whole thing squared. Or in other words, we get negative 1 to an even power, which always must result in 1 on the right side of the equation. And so that's the reasoning for this. That's the reason why as long as at least one of these numbers, P and Q, is congruent to 1 modulo 4, then this whole side of the equation evaluates to 1, and P and Q move together. I, I, I like to use the phrase move together. They're both quadratic residues, or else they're both non-residues. But they, they have the same general property. And that's very interesting. So, basically what we've logically deduced is that as long as one of the two odd primes, P or Q, is congruent to 1 modulo 4, then this whole side of the equation will equal 1. So K will equal 1, which means that P on Q and Q on P will be equal. So, you know, P is a quadratic residue modulo Q if and only if Q is a quadratic residue modulo P. So, they move together in that sense. You know, if one is a quadratic residue, then so is the other. And if one is a non-residue, so is the other. And that's what we see in these three cases, where at least one is congruent to one modulo 4. However, and this is the interesting part, well, actually all of this is interesting, but basically, k equals negative 1. It, you know, if we study, you know, what if both of them are not equal to 1 modulo 4? Well, what this really means by elimination is that P and Q are both equal to 3 modulo 4. And that's a very specific case, a very special case. Because it it's the case in which this side of the equation is negative 1 raised to an odd power. In which case we get K equals negative 1. And that means that one of these two quantities, P on Q or Q on P, is a residue and the other is a non-residue. And I'll show you some proof. Well, a little bit of proof right here. So if we say that P and Q are primes, odd primes, but they're not equal to 1 modulo 4, then we have a a bit of a process of elimination kind of proof that shows that P and Q are each congruent to 3 modulo 4. When we change it and make them both congruent to 3 modulo 4, that's when we get the, the different case, the special case, so to speak. And yeah, thank you very much for watching. I plan to release some other new videos uh, in the future as long as I uh, get the time to film them. So, uh, you know, thanks for supporting me, and I'll see you later.